Pleasure to present you our uh, not only uh, excellent uh, professor we have at the University of Berlin who is doing a huge job and uh, big efforts in order to keep alive our language, our heritage in a, as a whole. Uh, professor Shabot Alai, all of you, you know him. As I told you, I was not going to insist on their talents, what they have been producing, because it would take a lot of time to, uh, to talk about, about how many works he has been doing, he has been publishing. It's, it's also a pride for us having such a talent among uh, the Suryoye, uh, Surae, Assyrian communities. Uh, Shavot Alai, as you know, uh, is expert not only in the classical uh, languages or Semitic languages, but he's also he has been working for many years upon the modern dialects. He has been working, uh, Professor Jeffrey Khan mentioned him yesterday, as co-worker of the whole and huge work they have been doing for keeping at least um, a kind of memory of the dialects that are in danger, that have disappeared, and now, thanks to their work, uh, those dialects are still kept somehow. Uh, he is a full professor at the uh, University of Freie Berlin. And, uh, well, Shabo, I'm not going to talk about how we, we love each other, so uh, this is uh, worldwide known. And I'm, I'm happy. I'm very sorry that you, you couldn't come. I know that uh, until yesterday he was supposed to be here. But then, uh, w uh, as we say in German, the man stinkt und Gott lenkt. Uh, the man proposes and uh, God disposes. This is, uh, well, the case, but we have him online. He promised to, to be and he is still here. And he will, uh, his, his conference will be upon the expulsion of the Khabar Assyrians by ISIS in 2015. It's a very important topic. Unfortunately, as you know, so many times it happened, uh, this, is, this seems to be our destiny to suffer and suffer again and again uh, due to the circumstances. Uh, we have been experiencing in our own uh, land, homeland and territory. So, uh, without uh, taking more time, I know we are a bit uh, late. Uh, Shavo, uh, the role is yours. Thank you for, for accepting this, uh, being here with us, even if it's online. <laughs> Please uh, see me as one who is supporting and backing what you are doing there. Whatever you do, even if we do not agree in every point, but it is very important that we do something for our people according to our possibilities. And uh, uh, this is what we have to do, every one of us. All who are academicians at universities or elsewhere should do something like that, what Ephraim is doing. So thank you very much, uh, Ephraim. And I promise to come the next time. I hope that uh, we will not uh, again face such a problem. Now, uh, dear uh, friends and colleagues, um, uh, uh, this is the agenda what I wanted to talk about. Uh, Afrem told me now that I should talk about 35 minutes. It's too much, of course, for 35 minutes. But we will touch some of these uh, ideas. By 
talking about Khabur Assyrians, I want just to show you that uh, my knowledge uh, is based uh, for the historical point of view, from the historical point of view, is based on my own field research, which I did during the 90s until the 2000s, beginning of 2000s, especially in the Khabur villages, where I used to live in the village of Walto, the Nasri, for a long time, and visiting each village, sometimes every second house uh, in the villages. And of course, I, went, I visit, visited the Assyrians in Europe and USA, who were originating from Khabur area, and uh, gathered a lot of material, I think, I have uh, only from this air more than 120 hours of recordings, of which two uh, important books have been published. You see the, the, the titles of the books, both of them in the series Semitika Viva at Harasovic Falak 2008 and 2009. Now, <coughs> by showing uh, at the Khabur Assyrians, we have to think about these three points. Uh, <laughs> the tribal and linguistic composition, the history, well, they, they, they have a history of expulsion and resettlement. Uh, this is what we are talking about all the time, what Ephraim mentioned uh, just now. And then the coexistence with neighboring people, especially <coughs> the Arabs and the Kurds. Uh, by saying Khabur Assyrians, I use the term because linguistically they differ a little bit from the same people from the same Assyrians from Khakari who settled in Iraq, who settled somewhere else in Iran or in, in the Soviet, former Soviet Union uh, uh, and in and nowadays Russia and uh, elsewhere. So uh, they differ in, 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 in several linguistical aspects and also the way of life changed. But all of them are originating in, in, in Hakkari region, southeastern of Turkey on the border to Iran. And they use their, what we in the, in the literature call as, uh, as mountain Nestorians in the history, in, in the book of history. And the, many of them were almost independent. We sometimes we use the term semi-independent, but almost independent from the control by the Turkish, by the Ottoman state. Uh, however, during the genocide uh, of 1915, uh, these people of Hakkari had to leave their homeland and they moved with the aim to come back, to, fi to, to find a better solution for, the, for, the, for, for coming back. They moved to Ormia. Dear Shabur, can you just take a bit of distance in relation to your microphone, please? Ah, just yes. Just a bit, yeah. Okay. So, Thank you. Yes, the, uh, is this okay? Yeah, much better. Is yeah. this okay now? Much better, thank you. Ah, thank you. So these people uh, did not last so much in Ormia. Uh, uh, you remember 1918 when the patriarch Marcin Mar Benjamin has been killed in March. After the killing of Mar Benjamin, very shortly, uh, they thought they get support, will get support by the British army. Unfortunately, uh, they have been taken and they moved to the British army to Hamadan in Iran from Ormia. This means they have been brought uh, far away from their vision to uh, uh, very soon go back to their homeland. And from Hamadan later on, they became refugees now, put into camps, refugee camps in Ba'quba, northeast of uh, Baghdad for a while. And then in the beginning of the 20, they have been settled north of Iraq in the in, in old old northern Iraq in the mountainous areas, but also in the plain of Mosul in the old Assyria. The aim of these mountain Assyrians was all the time to be to go back home. But unfortunately, in 33, after establishing the new Iraqi government, they had no role anymore in this country, and the British army where they were serving as Levi, Le Levis, they did not consider them anything in this time. So there was a big problem, and then the, the fresh established army of Iraq, with the support of the British army, they uh, committed the so-called massacre of Simele, or Parman Simele. It took from 7 August 
till 16th in 1933. After these uh, massacres, who are known to all of you, uh, a big number of member, a big number of the, of the members of the Assyrian tribes, bigger tribes, especially Tiare and Huma, uh, decided to leave the country at all, decided to leave Iraq, because they said we can't trust these people anymore and we can't trust also the British, and they moved with the a permission at the beginning without, but then later with the permission of the French mandate in Syria uh, uh, to, to Syria and have been settled there under the supervision of the League of Nations. So this is an official settlement or resettlement of a, a group after the World uh, War I, after the genocide of 1915. The settlement was started with, with tent camps. Later they built some houses like this one, what we call in, in, in German Bienenkorbhäuser. I don't know the name in English, B and, and so on. So, uh, but later on, even their churches were of, of uh, tone and uh, uh, they established a new life in the steppe, in the, in the Syrian steppe here, on the both sides of the river Khabur. Uh, you know, in the same time, many other people have been resettled, settled, especially the Bedouins, the nomads, have been settled by the, by the state, by the French mandate, but later by the Syrian state. But you have nowhere such a paradise-like area in Syria, in this, in this region. So only the Assyrians of Kabul could establish something uh, unique in the area. And I don't know how many of you uh, took the flight from Damascus or from Aleppo to Khamishli, and you could see really a green paradise-like uh, line uh, north of Haseke, starting north of Haseke until uh, Merumta, uh, Tal Tawil, in the north of the Assyrian villages. Now the composition of the people here, uh, we have mainly the so-called uh, upper Tiari, uh, Tiare Lesha, Tiare Lesha. Uh, we have one village uh, uh, originally being Tiarechtesha, and then we have uh, Halmunai, we have the Truma, we have Arbush, Tal, Baz, Diz, and so on. Uh, so different tribes came together here, but they have been settled according to the tribal affiliation into different camps, later villages, which they call still camps, Kampa. They call the village Kampa in many villages. Um, some of them, of course, use the term Mata or Mata. Uh, and so uh, we have, when I went there the first time in the 90s, more than different 25 different dialects. And we had uh, uh, clusters of dialects, which I call dialect cluster, uh, Tiari cluster, Truma cluster, then we have the Hakkarnai, Hakkari cluster, consisting of big, big tribes, and then we have the cluster of Gnesha Mistin, uh, where uh, we have, we will see some, one of the villages at least mentioned, and then some dialect may be more close or outside, living outside of the, of the Hakkari area, which was Halmon and uh, Levenai. Now these people, as I said, they turned the, the area to a paradise-like area, and many people of Kamishli and Hasaka used on weekends to go there for uh, having parties, having fun on the, on the on the uh, Khabur River, there were very good restaurants and so on. And uh, they built new new villages, very nice villages, new churches, which is very not so such new, the Qadisha church in Tamar, or the most uh, recent, one of the most recent big cathedrals was Matmariam of Walto. Uh, this had been built when I was actually living there in the village. The architect was from Khamishli, it was Bashir Saadi, the main architect. But they created also a culture in the area. Here, a big wedding, wedding ceremony in the 2000s with the uh, uh, Khoshaba, uh, with Khoshaba in the beginning, starting many people of, uh, know him. Khoshaba, he has the name Khoshaba Raqada, Khoshaba Simbele, Khoshaba, but it is known as the famous Khoshaba, uh, the big, big dancer and teacher of dancing. Uh, or they have uh, had a, a, a huge knowledge about their history, which I could record in many hours of uh, sessions with these people. Uh, so um, 
I was very happy to uh, meet people, villages functioning in the 90s. And these were the villages on the both sides of uh, the Khabur. When I was there, we have 35 villages plus two, two, um, two small villages which are Tel Ashnan, Sharqi, and Gharbi. Uh, people who were from Tel Tamar having their cattle outside of the, of the, of the town of Tel Tamar. Now this is the, the community of the Khabur Assyrians. Then let's jump uh, to the um, state, Islamic State uh, in Iraq and Syria and ask ourselves what it is. If we look at Wikipedia, this is the article of Wikipedia saying that the Islamic State, uh, at times known as the Islamic State Militant Group, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIL, or the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, ISIS, also referred to by its Arabic language acronym Daesh, Dawla, Dawlat Iraq, Ushiam, is an Islamist militant jihadist group, so Islamist militant jihadist group, and former unrecognized Qasi state that follows a Salafi jihadist doctrine based on the Sunni branch of Islam. These are very important terms, so Islamic milit militant jihadist group, Quasi state or a state, and it follows the Salafi jihadist doctrine uh, on the Sunni branch, based on the Sunni branch of Islam. Uh, of course, for us, we call them militants, uh, we call them uh, terrorists, we call them whatever we call them. But according to what we, you, you can read here, they are based actually on the Salafi Sunni branch of Islam. So, what they are doing, they take their doctrine from the Sunni branch of Islam, from the books, from the Hadith, from the Quran, for their behaviors, they wanted to live a life uh, according to the first uh, Ummah of Muhammad in the seventh century in Mecca. So this is, they want to create a, a, a paradise-like life uh, that they think it was in the seventh century during Muhammad's times. And they refused everything behind the Umayyad times, so uh, you know uh, the Umayyad uh, uh, in the 700, at 702, Abdul Malik II uh, uh, ordered to destroy all new churches, all crosses from the churches, and, and, and many big problems to, to non-Muslims, especially to Christians. So they wanted to go back to this time. So they said every church which has been built after the Umayyads should be destroyed, and everything non-Islamic should be destroyed. And this uh, targeted not only us alone, but everybody who was not according to their uh, doctrine, uh, especially the other non-Muslim uh, uh, groups in the, in the Middle East, the Yazidis and the others as well. Now in Syria, uh, it started very early, especially after 2003, the regime changed uh, in Baghdad, after the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime, with the uh, invention of the uh, on the, of the Americans, and I remember <coughs> myself being there in, in Syria on the borderline. Uh, I had a driver, an Arab driver, who was, used to take me from village to village by doing my research on Arabic dialects, and this man became a fighter against the unbelievers, infidels, the Americans in Iraq. So, uh, you know, in Syria, everybody who knows Syria, nothing was uh, really un unplanned there. So the government seemed to have sent militant Muslims, Islamists, to Iraq to fight against the Americans because the regime in Syria was afraid that the next step will be a regime change in Syria. But everybody who knew the area knew that also the fact that these Islamists will later turn their weapons against the regime itself because in their eyes the regime itself was infidel. And my driver became one of these fighters, and once his brother called me to, to talk to him, maybe he will stop these actions. But he said, no, no, I, I respect you very much, you didn't do anything against me, but you all, the Christians, and your, your friends, the Nusairis, uh, the Alawis, are our, fi our, uh, our enemies, so we have to fight against, to fight against you. So this, you see that the Syrian regime started supporting a movement which turned like a boomerang against itself. So, when in 2011 the uproar 
started the so-called spring, the Arab Spring started in Syria, uh, everybody wants freedom. The Arabs, the Muslims, pardon, and the Sunni uh, militants, they were not part of this. They later, when we uh, entered this movement, being against the regime with weapons, and the, the, whole, uh, the whole spring became a movement, an Islamic, Islamic movement in the area. Uh, and then they started to shout with Allah Akbar against all, not only the regime, but all, uh, in their eyes, all infidels. One of the very important attacks have been uh, in 2013 against Ma'lula, the town of Ma'lula. Everybody maybe knows it. And you can see this very nice uh, village or town which has been destroyed in November 2013 uh, uh, in the same kind of attacks like later against, uh, against uh, the Khabur, the Khabur villages. Or they destroyed. Uh, so. Now, the, the other, one of the goals of these Islamists was to show that all Muslims belong to a one state, so they have to destroy the so-called uh, 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 borders put down by uh, the French and British Sykes-Picot agreement. So they wanted to set, set an end to this division of Bilad al-Sham, of Mesopotamia, Beth Naharin, and, and Levant and Syria. Uh, and that's why they started their, uh, their, their uh, uh, battles in this, in this area, dominated by the Arab, or formerly Arab Bedouins, who were very open, I don't know why, but they were very open to this new doctrine, the Islamistic doctrine, uh, and uh, it was horrifying, especially the area uh, where uh, I was doing my field research, my Arabs became by majority members of this new uh, Islamic movement, uh, Daesh. Uh, so you see, uh, in 2013 already existed New York Times, a map uh, supposing a new division, a new uh, fragmentation of Syria and Iraq. So, people started thinking of this Islamic State to be in the future really a state. So even Westerners start giving these people their right, the right to get a state. You see in the middle the big Sunni, uh, Sunni Caliphate or whatever uh, to call it, maybe even with, uh, with Baghdad as the uh, capital city. But in 14, uh, in August, July, August, the militants uh, the Islamic terrorists, they attacked all other villages in, in classical, in, in antique Assyria, so in Nineveh Plain. And there they expelled thousands, 100, 150,000 people from their, from their homes uh, while we were uh, almost silent. And after, after that, they, they attacked the Yazidis uh, in Jabal Sinjar uh, and also uh, committed crimes against the, the Yazidis, so uh, what is said to be a genocide against the Yazidis uh, later. But they, they targeted not only the human beings, not only the, for them the so-called infidels, but they targeted also the old culture of the region. So they destroyed not the museum of Mosul, the, 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 the old monasteries, many, many old monasteries, uh, the, uh, the Assyrian artifacts and so on, but they destroyed also Palmyra, uh, which is really a symbol, a symbol of, of uh, the history of the area in, in Tadmor, or they destroyed Hatra, which is really very important for us historically and for the mixture of old, uh, 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 old Akkadian Assyrian with Aramaic and later uh, modern Aramaic. So it's very important sites. They have been destroyed this all. So the aim was to, to uproot the people who do not belong to us, according to their belief, uh, uh, totally from the area. So nothing, there is no hint, no traces uh, of these people in the area. This was the aim. And in this regard, also the Khabur villages, they were part of this agenda because they formed an open and unguarded uh, front. If you look at the map again, here uh, in 2015, you see in the northeast of Syria, I can't show you, uh, or maybe we can here. Uh, do you see my mouse? Do you see the mouse? Yeah. No? 
Yes, okay, yes. so northeastern yes. Syria. Ah, you see it here in this area. So it is actually an open front. And I remember me and others giving talks. Please take care of the Khabur Assyrians because we see this front. It is open. But uh, uh, actually, when and here you can see it even much better. Uh, uh, here, the, the front between Hasaka, or here maybe between Sitcha and Tiltamr, and here, it is directly on the front. And you say they took already Mabruka here. Mabruka is actually a foundation of the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch uh, for the family as Najah in the 30s. So it is genuine, genuine Syriac city. Uh, but this whole area has been taken and then they took in 2013, uh, 15, pardon, 23rd of February, exactly 100 years after the genocide of 1915. Again, uh, uh, those survivors of the genocide of 1915 settled down by the League of Nations under their supervision. So this responsibility for these villages should be in the hands of the um, of the uh, 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 United Nations now, because this, these people have been settled there under their supervision and guarantees, and unfortunately nobody did anything at the beginning. And here you have from Aina News uh, very fresh information uh, about uh, the village, uh, the villages. Uh, they are not very correct all the time, but here you have then the further continuation of the of from Tal Masas. Uh, you can read all this information in uh, in in uh, in our org, in our org or elsewhere, because this is part of our history now. And I'm very thankful, actually, to Aina Org that they gathered a lot of information about the attacks of the uh, of these terrorists of the Islamic State uh, against uh, our people in Syria and, and Iraq. So you can open this, and there uh, you can read also this that uh, the Assyrian church is destroyed. Excuse me, Afrem, can you see me? We see you very well. Don't oh. continue. Yeah, please. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. So you see how many churches and villages have been destroyed. Uh, at the beginning, Mat Mariam, of Walto, uh, and so on. You can go through all these villages, especially Rabban uh, Minyo, uh, Umrat uh, Rabban Petyum, in in uh, in Tal Hormuz, uh, and this was the result. The church, we say, the cathedral or the big church of uh, Walto, which has been uh, destroyed. But uh, uh, heartbreaking information can be read in the book by Abdul Mirza in German. Yeah, we left. We left. We came to to the Khabur with Bafi, but we has been forced. Uh, uh, have been forced to leave without shoes to leave our home again. And then the heartbreaking report by Hanna from Tel Shamiram, who, uh, has, which has been broadcasted on uh, a Syrian uh, global network, uh, and Assyria TV uh, uh, aired the, the same uh, interview again with a discussion uh, in, in March this year. So we have, you can hear what happened actually exactly to, to our people. Uh, I, I am moving because I am looking at, the, at my clock. Uh, now what, what, is, what, is the, what is behind now? After uh, ES has been, uh, well, people think that they defeated them and now they, they are gone. But the ideology of ISIS, of ISIS stays, of course, because this is based on the Islamic rules. If you want to interpret Islamic Sharia and law, then you can behave like these people. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, and that's why this idea remains existent there, although uh, the people left, you will find this, these ideas also among Kurds. Uh, Til Tamri is now dominated by Kurds and Arab, and the, I see as, a, as an utopia to reconstruct this, this Assyrian enclave again. Uh, if we look at the map now, you see, you have nothing here, no traces at all. It is just, it is Kurdish controlled, POD controlled area under with the support of the, of the Americans. Of course, the Turks are not very happy about this. So they are doing attacks. And I today heard that there were attacks on Tal Tamr, uh, pardon, on Tal Jum'ah, 
which is uh, uh, which is Halmun uh, until Jum'a Halmun and Nerumta uh, until Dawid. So there were continuously attacks from the Turkish side now against our villages. Now again we are in between the fire, crossfire of the of different powers. For all this behavior of the modern times, we have in the past exactly the same behaviors towards our people. I could mention two, uh, two movements or two, two, um, two occasions during the history of the 19th, in the, in the history of the 19th century. One of them was the Mire Corps of Rwandas, uh, 32 till 35, and then we have the Hamidian massacres, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, due to time. And if we look at this introduction of a manuscript, it says in the year uh, 1832, uh, uh, yeah, in 1832, what happened in Al Qosh? Yeah? Uh, it is Kashisha uh, Damianos from Al Qosh. Uh, he speaks of Bnai Gehanna Aula, Aule, so the sons of the, of the uh, hell. Yeah? And he say, uh, only priest, Ashishe Balhuth Shaura. Yeah, Balhuth Shaura. Only priests, seven priests have been killed in, in, in uh, Al Qosh. And then Hadrish Daira, yeah, you can read of course, Hana Rish Daira, Miakra and so on, Gabriel Abdid Mari. So Rish Daira means the, abd, the abbot of the, of the monastery of Rabban almost. Gabriel Dembo, uh, and then they killed uh, the, the, the people who have been killed. Mpa, Minyana, Daktil, Path, Khushwana, Latlathma, Dlabusrana, Washta, Ushaurin, Akhanna. So 376 people, except the clergymen, have been killed alone in al -Khosh. We are not talking about the, what happened. If we read what Nebes, one of the main authors about this Muhammad Pasha, wrote, he says, I quote, Muhammad Pasha was of great piety and righteousness in observing Islamic law. He did not undertake any matter without having obtained a fatwa from the ulama. Their opinion was authoritative for his actions, the law he relied on was the Holy Quran and the rules of venerable Islamic law. So he's actually doing all his actions based on the same doctrine what we have uh, with the terrorists of the Islamic State. Wilhelm was repeating what I told, read to you, but mistaking by the numbers, about 300 Chaldeans were killed in this attack, and its victims also included Gabriel Dambo, the Patriarchal Vikar Manisha, and seven priests. The village itself was sacked, the survivors robbed, and the famous tomb of Nahum destroyed. Uh, uh, you can read it by Wilhelm But the final statement by Nebes is, Miri Kora state was dominated by fanatic Muslims. So what is, if I ask you, what is the difference between what we read here and what the Islamic State did in 2015? Actually, the Haim, if you, we, could, we could read because these people attacked also Turabdin and killed hundreds of, uh, of uh, our people in Azur and, and, and somewhere else. So it is actually the same behavior, argumenting with the Quran, killing the non-believers. They killed, of course, the Yazidis and so on. I did not uh, mention them uh, all, but it's the same behavior towards un unbelievers and destroying their villages, their churches and so on. Uh, let me uh, uh, come to the final end. Uh, uh, if you look, as I said, at the map, what should we think of the future of the enclave, the Assyrian enclave of Khabur? It is now part of the uh, area controlled by the Kurdish POD with the support of the Americans. How long will this be the case? We don't know. Uh, many of you who know the area are aware of that the Kurdish people do not succeed 50% of the population. They were at about 40% of the population of the area, maybe less. And the other 40-40% were Arabs. 
and the other 10% were our people, the uh, Armenians and Syrians. But uh, I always asking me myself uh, to come to the final uh, end. Yes, uh, the, the, the final end is actually um, taken from uh, uh, John Joseph's The Nestorians and Their Muslim Neighbors from 61, and he cites a letter written by the patriarch, Marwell Shimon, to the Tsar of Russia in 1868, after one very difficult uh, attack against his people. And he says, the Kurds have forcibly taken many of our churches and convents. convents. They constantly abduct our virgins, brides, and women, forcing them to turn Muslims. The Turks are worse, they do not protect us, demand military taxes, poll tax, also the Kurds take our money for they consider us zirko. Now, such being our condition, we beseech your mightiness for the sake of Jesus, his baptism and cross, either to free us from such a state or to procure us a remedy. Dear friends and dear colleagues, what shall we do? Shall we start looking for a savior from outside, a support from outside to survive in our, our own country? In the case of the British, one of the uh, Khaburis told me, Bronish me, here my son, Aturaya Saklil Butma, Warabaya Rishi Qutma. I don't know how many people understood this, this saying by this old man, just to say that people from outside are using us for their own interests, and we are active to do this and that, but we get nothing. They are getting the lion part of the, of the, of the cake. So uh, this is something we should discuss uh, ourselves. What shall we do? Shall we seek? our salvation outside in powers today, the Americans, tomorrow the Russians, or the British, and so on. So this is something which we, with which I would like to end uh, due to time so that we can have some minutes of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergei Todi. As you see, I don't call him Professor Shavo, I call him my brother. Uh, we, we never call uh, each other Professor or what else because we are brothers in many senses. So uh, I'm thankful to you for this uh, insightful, this excellent conference. Uh, it's, it's a pity that such topics are dealt in such a short time. Probably we would need a whole session, probably a whole day where we could discuss and where we could, you know, share uh, not only ideas, proposals, but also our pain. While you were mentioning this, I was remembering all the periods we have been suffering. We were undergone uh, horrible periods, horrible situations. And I'm not going to repeat it because it's just a sign of sadness and, you know, it's better to, to, to focus on positive issues. This is why I'm thankful to you. When Shabu uh, asked me what topic would I, he proposed two topics. He's uh, an expert in language, but I knew that this topic was really needed to, to be explained by an expert. And I'm thankful to you for this, uh, Shabu, that you have accepted to talk about such a sad a topic for us, but also important to learn from it because we have still not or we haven't learned yet what to do. The, the last question that the British, that the French and the others, what we have to do is to learn to defend ourselves in an intelligent way. We have been always looking for the hands, for the protection, for this and that of the others. Politics will not defend you guys. This is my conviction. And I'm talking only as in personal way, not as an academic way. Second, uh, this, this, this many years, years ago, ago this led us to think about in, in every, every sense. sense. 
if we don't uh, protect ourselves, the others will not do it. And Shab has shown uh, again and again we barfus var misin bir gecomun barfus misin bir gecim. You know what it means? So we are still suffering this uh, processes of not only being thrown out but killed, massacred, forced, and so on. But now let's let's have a uh, we have a bit yeah ten minutes uh, time to some questions. I ask you to do specific questions because uh, of the, uh, the time limit. If you don't mind, I'm going down now because you know we have streaming microphone and other microphones. I'm going to move now to the other side in order to help uh, the people asking questions. Just a second. Uh, are there any any questions? Uh, but just short question. Yeah. See, this is. Edmund I insist, just short questions, please, because of the limit of time. You take a booklet. This is why I was insisting. <laughs> Uh, just I want to correct the uh, number, how much killed in bike is this? It is uh, 70, not uh, 4. There are 11 one from Tel Hermes in the first day they killed, one from Tel Baz, and uh, two from Tel Shamiram. We find it uh, after two, two, uh, two, two months, and uh, three killed from kidnaps which taken by ISIS. Uh, three yes. persons. So they are now uh, 70, it's not uh, four persons. Just to correct that number, thank you very thank much you very for much. your was, lecture. Thank you. It was just uh, the text written by Aina. I did not mention the, the numbers. So it's just. Yeah. Thank you very much, Edmund. Uh, is there any, any other question? Matai? Yeah, please come and. Okay. و بحالة موريو نحالة دكتور أستيب فرصوفوي في عمينا هاركي ما تعرف سانشمي ملوخ سما يلوخ مثقبل نوثو you recorded a lot of stories and dialects from the خابور Assyrians I hope you have digitized them right now because this is a treasure that uh, I'm sure uh, we will be able to listen to for generations to come. How many um, Assyrians were there totally of these 35 villages in the end, just before ISIS attacked? Yani if, you, if you count the number, that's one. And the second question is, do you think there is a chance for them, like we do in Tur Abdin, to rebuild the, the villages and return? Do you think there is a viable and realistic chance for them? Yeah, very shortly, um, uh, the recordings are all, uh, I think all of them are digitized and are in the, in the library of the University of Heidelberg. Uh, some of them are published in a book, you can read texts actually, if you are uh, interested, there are, I think, 99 texts on 700 pages of, translated to German, uh, so origi original language plus translation. And I hope to make even a dictionary, but I was not able to do so until now. Uh, the numbers of uh, 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 inhabitants of the villages when I was there were about 16 till 18,000. But uh, just before uh, uh, IS uh, attacked the villages, there were only uh, three till 5,000 left because they were afraid of, of the incidents and people moved, had moved already to Sitja, to Hasaka, to Pamishli. And some and many of them were already, already leaving the country to the west. So um, this is the numbers. And the, the final question is actually the most important one. For the return movement, you need uh, stable 
political situation. And there is no stable situation there in Syria. And uh, you can't trust any, any political movement there, neither the Kurds nor the, our own people. You can't trust anybody because they are living from day to day. They can't promise to you anything. They just do their best to, as long as they get money from the Americans, of course. As soon as the Americans say, no, we have to pay the money to the Ukraine, you will get no money anymore, they will have to stop fighting. They don't have these weapons to fight themselves. So that's why um, I think uh, a movement of, to return, which I recorded in my text, people returning from Russia, from Krasnodar, from Kharkiv, even from Kharkiv and elsewhere, Novgorod, people going back to, to, to Iraq and then to Syria. But uh, for such a movement, you need a political stability and also economic stability. And this is not given yet, and I, I don't believe that in the next 10 years anything will be changed. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shabubia. There is another uh, question now. Uh, up there, please. Um, Shlomo Malfono. تودي لي ملثو دم قدم لخلان ملثو كتف على شاني بشغل غلبة انترسانت مثل زبنو ياريخو كف الحنو بحق له السياسي دو دعاء ميدا ومرد قريش لوزو هو رايذي بملثيذو مات دعاء ميدا مستعمل مغلبة حيلة بقليمو كعبد بيث نهرين كعبد أوثر وشو لايذي لشانو يعني شغلو يقول أن كذا عينا وميدان وحزيلا إلو قاي قيو أعا ميدا مستعمل بزبنة بدلة وأحيلة نخروية كلها مستعمل لي وشو ليدي دتري لشان لد يوما لو ميتستعملينا ترون أحيلة حافظة دد يوما من كل لازم سيمينا خد خد أمثو خد زوعو أمثو نويو وده ترتيب وشاطو من الأفضل تلوث وشاطو من الأخ ما تقلي مولاوي ستابيل هاي ليتو يعني بث نهرين لا تيو هيج ستابيل يعني بس ده بنو دورة فايد كله وبس ده بنو دوثي ستيلكوه وبورن يايذوخ ما بس ده بنو دينا قد لوه ستابيل وها ميدان كلوزم حالق ده وصلو دعوره أو بورن يايذوخ كلوزم كوله يا Yes, compli complicated uh, uh, questions. As a, as, a, as a minority, and I tell, say this regarding our numbers, or the figures we have, we, are, we have less people on the ground. Um, so always people try to use you for their own interests. And this is their right, of course, but our right would be to fight for our own interests. And the problem we have, which I can see in almost all organizations, all organizations we have, they try to do something for their people. There is no organization uh, in, our, in our people saying we are doing something for the others. Everyone thinks he's doing the best. So the problem is that we don't have any uh, common agenda together for our country, for our homeland, for our nation, and we are more fighting each other instead of supporting, even if it is behind the, 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 the what is it, the, the coalition. Yeah? So even if it is secretly, we should be able to support each other. But instead, we are fighting against each other openly and secretly. And that's why we are used by the others. Otherwise, uh, we have to accept that Kurds have their rights, that Arabs have their rights, like we have our rights in that area, and they have their right to fight for their own rights. But the same is due to us. We have the right to fight for our rights, for our people, for our ground, for our lands, and so on. And we can cooperate with them. We have to actually, if you live, live with the Kurds and with the Arabs and with the Turks, you can't be their enemy. If you are neighbors, you have to do the best to be at least friendly with them and they friendly to you. You can't be their enemy. And this is what I say. We have to think about a way of, out of our dilemma to try. There are enough parties and groups in the, in the, in the Kurdish, Turkish, Arabic population who I hope are very positive towards our question as well. 
and we have to cooperate with these people where needed. And we should, even if we are against this openly, secretly we should support our parties wherever they are to be stronger than being weaker. And if a party of ours is strong, then we all take a part of this. And this is what I think uh, should be very, uh, should we think about. And uh, the stability is of course needed for people to go to leave Germany to go back. Uh, you can't go back if you live in Germany. Of course, if you are very new, then you can go back. If you came from uh, from uh, uh, Amishli, you could go back. But nobody goes back, actually. And nothing happened in Amishli. And let me say one sentence regarding this issue. In 2000, pardon, in 1999, I published an article about the, the Khabur villages area, and that and that time already, the Arkin, this is the Archidiakon, the the head priest of the Assyrian Church, told me, my son, our problem is that our eyes, our eyes looking outside, and he said, you know, from these. 15, 16,000 Assyrians in the villages, more than, I think, nine or 10,000 of them already are registered, seeking for visa to leave the country. So, and there were nothing at that time, no, no battles, no, of course, we had problems with, with the politics and, and with water in Khabur and so on, but there was no reason to leave the country as it was later in the, in the time of Daesh. So thank, this is our problem. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, in line with what you were the line in order to conclude this, this excellent conference, you mentioned the word Otma. At the beginning there were, let's say, uh, the Arabs, as you mentioned, and then the English and French, and now we do Ahnaintar of Otma Bjan. So, if we don't learn, as you have clearly underlined, to work together and not because the worst enemy of the Assyrian communities plural, is inside, is not outside. But we are not conscious of a fact. All we come together and we agree with each other what to do or we will at least be by our own the worst enemies and this means the last hope of a people that wants to survive or you believe in your own nation or you firmly believe in your own identity and existence and leaving aside your differences now you have to fight for surviving this is the reality but instead we, we fight in order to divide. We fight in order to create, you know, and circumstances that do not lead us to the union. This is why we have to focus on If we learn this, we, will, we, we have a hope. I, I want to finish with a positive point. This is not the first time, not the second, not the fourth, not the fifth, not the sixth. But we, we are still here. Let's learn to live together in a peaceful way, respectful way. And despite our differences, we can work together. And this is what we have to do. I am thankful to you, Akhoni uh, Shabo, uh, for I know that you, you, you don't feel well. We wish you all the best. Gute besserung, hulmano basimo. Oh, next time, even you, uh, we will take you by car. I told him, if you, go, you have to come only to Madrid and then we'll pick you up because, uh, uh, but at the end he couldn't, he should go to the doctor and so on. This is why he's not here. So thank you very much uh, for, for the effort you have been doing and we will wait for you next year. Now we are going to shift to the next uh, conference. Let me just sit.
Siéntase, Siéntase, por favor, si quiere. Salvan online, está en línea. Genial. Salvan de la media, de eso. Until now, the connection, the virtual connection has been excellent. We hope that at the end, this last one will be also successful. Hello, this is good to see you. Well, Sargon, you should keep a stream up. Share now, share now, share now. Could we, yeah, could we do one spy? Maybe. Rather spy, rather the stream. You should not hold your hands on the stream. But smile, you can share. You have the lumadan, or the rayad, or the mukama, or the durasha. أخونا سارغون دونابيت أخذيدوتم ملبانا كشيرة وجبارة دي بخاية بأمريكا أو ترامرا بسيم القبلتو he was also supposed to come but at the end the corona bloody corona virus has somehow interrupted all the possibilities so we hope to have you next time face to face but I know that you, he has been asking us whether we were going to stream it, uh, all, stream all the conferences. But at the, event, at the end, we decided to focus only on those that were uh, given virtually as yours. So, uh, most of you know Professor Sargon Donabet. He is currently professor at uh, Roger William University. And, you know, uh, I would dare to say that he is a reference not only at the local or national level in the United States, but he is internationally uh, one of the top uh, Assyrian professors we have. And I'm very proud. Uh, when we last met, we were remem remembering uh, Matai, uh, the, the nice experience when we first met in, in Malaga. And since then, uh, a brotherhood has been created. And also, this is why I am so happy and honored and proud uh, having him here, sharing with him this why, where he, was, he will talk about an overview of Assyrian history through a lens of Assyrian studies, obstacles, theories, and narratives. The role is yours, uh, Sargon. Thank you. Basim Arab Afram, thank you very, very much. Um, to Professor Ephraim Yildiz uh, for uh, affording me this opportunity, uh, and to the NINVA Chair uh, at the University of Salamanca. I am very honored to be here with you all today. Um, I apologize that I am not there in person. As Ephraim said, issues with the, the coronavirus in the, in the house, but also um, over, over scheduling, which was partially my fault. Um, so I do apologize for that, and I hope to see you all uh, very, very soon, hopefully next year, um, at a similar time. So I, I'll jump right into it, So, because I don't know uh, how much time uh, we have, but the title of my, my talk is, is going to be an overview of Assyrian history, as Ephraim said, uh, thinking about Assyrian studies as a particular lens, and, and looking at the obstacles, theories, narratives, very generally, very basically, um, to, to have people sort of become part of this uh, larger discussion. Largely what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of background um, and talk a bit about historiography. So uh, the idea of historiography, of course, is, is sort of how history has been done. 
And from my perspective, I want to, to challenge a lot of the narratives. That's what I've been working on is challenging the narratives that have been created thus far uh, about the Assyrian people uh, or peoples and communities, as you said, plural. So let me, let me start off by saying, um, I want to also say thank you to Shabo. I only came on at the end of Shabo's talk, but some, some people may find it funny because I, I, I was thinking about the issue of water in the Khabur as he was ending, and I thought to myself, um, not having water is as problematic as a war zone for people to, to think about. Um, for the most part, Assyrians do not leave their territory because they've been... Uh, because there's a, a sense of just a desire to move to a more economically prosperous region. Um, there has been a consistent effort to have them leave for, for quite some time. And I would argue that's one type of violence that's done against them. There's another type of violence that that's happens sort of consistently with Assyrians, and that is a violence that's done by, by the written word um, and by sort of this ontological and epistemological uh, attempt at expressing who the Assyrians are or are not. Um, and this leads me into this discussion, this larger discussion of historiography. I'm just going to share my screen here, if it's possible. Um, let's see if I can do that quickly. Okay, so apologies if everyone can bear with me. Um, is that, does that look okay? Everyone see that? Um, okay, so uh, again, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be here with you. Um, uh, I'll give you a sort of a brief overview today. As, as Ephraim said, uh, I'm a professor of history and cultural studies. Uh, at Roger Williams University, which is in Rhode Island. Uh, I live in the Boston area, and I've been working on uh, the Assyrian history, culture, language, community for many years. Uh, I completed my PhD in 2009, 2010 at the University of uh, Toronto. So I've had a, a few years of experience in these different fields. Um, I've been particip participating in conferences since probably 2003. So um, this will make a little bit of sense as I start going through it, I think, for most folks. Uh, so um, the contents really talk a bit about the crux of the matter. What is the crux? What is the issue um, at hand with historiography? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the problems with history and historiography, um, sort of the old fields of study, why they're there, what they've done, the problems that they've caused, and then a sense of forward momentum, I hope, and possible solutions to some of this. Now, just so you know, this is a, this is a huge topic. I mean, this could be talked about for, I mean, this is partially something that I'm working on for a book right now. So this is a much larger piece. Um, so bear with me as we go through it. Now, um, I wanted to read, uh, as part of what I did for, for a, a paper uh, that I was recently asked to participate in, or a discussion, a journal discussion, um, I sort of welded together or, or amalgamated together this idea of utilizing not just um, the written word, because I think the written word and seeing how violence is done to Assyrians through academia is one piece of it, but also how that is also carried on through initial reactions or, let's say, personal um, anecdotes. Now, of course, as we all know, we typically talk about data or data as being um, a large collection of things. But the reality is, is if you have one story, it's an anecdote. If you have many stories, they become data or data, right? Um, this, this will become data as, as we start to collect more and more of these stories. But I think this is more telltale of how um, these experiences have worked. So let me start off by giving you a little bit of this background. Um, at a Mesa conference annual meeting in Denver, Colorado in 2015, uh, there was a book fair. And at this book fair, there was an academic speaking with an editor about a possible prospectus. The conversation concerned the issue of indigenous and marginalized communities in the Middle East. The scholar began by illustrating the ways which many communities had been minoritized and marginalized and forced into obscurity and thus endangered. The editor listened intently, nodding as the writer illustrated examples and historical context. Such conversations were indeed happening uh, all around the, the conference. Um, 
And while this was the case, the conversations were not necessarily unique. This one in particular was not necessarily unique in its content and form, perhaps, um, but, uh, excuse me, it was, it was unique in its content and form, but perhaps not in its function, as these conversations are fairly typical. Now, at that moment, unexpectedly, a second writer inserted themselves into this conversation. The scholar was animated, British, and adamant about something. The entrance into the conversation was blunt. We're gonna do it, he said. Um, do what? Questioned the editor. Ah, yes, my book, responded the first, um, the scholar. Now that scholar who had butted into the conversation had just received rave reviews for their new monograph, just published with that same university press, and was visibly thrilled. Why wouldn't they be? The work was endorsed by more than half a dozen celebrated scholars of Middle East studies. The, the writer turned and noticed the other writer sitting down in the chair and said, so what do you do? And the writer seated uh, responded by saying, I work on marginalized and minoritized groups in the Middle East, like the Assyrians. That scholar who butted into the conversation replied, minorities are politicized. They're used by Western powers and have benefited greatly. They are the only ones in the Middle East doing well, stated the interloper. Doing well, responded the seated scholar. Give me an example. The Alawites in Syria, said the scholar who butted in. Truly, responded that first scholar seated. This is the argument in the midst of the existential threat that is confronted by some peoples and communities, like the Assyrians, the Yazidis, and others, you compare them in scale and power to the ruling regime in Syria. They are endangered communities, and we should see them as such, and they are disappearing very quickly from the Middle East, counted the Cedar scholar. Endangered, you cannot apply these terms to such communities. Why not? Why not explain them as they are? In what ways are Assyrians not endangered? replied the seated scholar. After a short time, the standing scholar realized they had to move away from the conversation and, and abruptly walked away, and then returned about five minutes later and responded, you know, that's true. Very few people even know about the Assyrians. I mean, I only learned about them after visiting a restaurant by an Assyrian, owned by an Assyrian in Belgium, end quote. Now, I offer this anecdote to show you that this is the type of uh, of responses that many people have probably experienced in their lives, but this is also happening at the academic level. Uh, this was, again, a conversation by two academics at the Middle East Studies Association annual meeting. And the scholar who had published the book was a well-known scholar and being endorsed by many, many scholars um, around the world. Now, what is the issue here? Well, and why Assyrian studies? Well, the, the older fields, Assyriology, Syriac studies, modern Middle East, um, possibly Neo-Aramaic studies, all these different fields of study have been created over time um, with one thing in common. And that is that the place of Assyrians or of the emic Assyrian understanding has been sort of put on the back burner, meaning that each one of these fields was created, in particular the ones that are specifically Assyrian oriented, like Assyriology or Syriac studies, and of course, uh, let's say Neo-Aramaic studies, more modern language uh, or linguistic or phonological stuff, um, was all created really by non-Assyrian scholars. And so the Assyrians themselves have not really had a major say in all of this. And this goes back to really sort of the early um, Western colonial process, right? The, uh, the Western colonial and oriental process. Um, Austin Henry Layard, Hormuz Rassam, from the time of the, re, the re, quote, rediscovery of Assyria, um, there's been this desire to sort of find out more about what this ancient culture was, how it looked, how they, how they discussed it, but also to sort of see it in its modern context. Does it exist in a modern context or does it not? And many scholars sort of point to this time period um, of the, the early to mid 1800s as sort of this rebirth of an interest in the Assyrians, um, in the ancient Assyrians, but also sort of by accident in the, in the modern Assyrians as well. Um, now, what is the crux of all of this? And I, I use this quote, I'm not gonna read the whole quote, but the crux of all of this is, I believe, um, that there's a normative framework that Assyrians are sort of seen through. And the framework is the crux of Lord Byron. Now, this is, this is Lord Byron, uh, English poet. Many of you know Lord Byron. Lord Byron's famous poet poem, um, on the, about the Assyrian. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the whole discussion of the, 
uh, the depth of, of Sennacherib, right, of Sennacherib. Now, of course, this discussion is sort of like the lens in which many Europeans viewed the Assyrians from prior to even the rediscovery of Assyria. But once the rediscovery of Assyria occurred, this sort of understanding, this sort of biblical understanding of who the Assyrians were was always part of that normative framework. It was always part of the framework of which, or the lens by which the West sort of viewed the East. Now, what, what does this all mean, and how does this sort of contribute to, the, to this major issue at hand? Well, um, I'm going to use this, this idea of bias, of academic bias, and uh, what's also termed epistemic violence. Um, a colleague of ours, uh, many, many of you know, uh, Mariam Gorgas' work um, on, on indigenous uh, scholarship and the Assyrians, and she's done a, a quite a bit about um, this issue of of how epistemic violence occurs, especially within the, the realm of Iraqi studies, uh, modern Iraqi studies. I'm just gonna give you sort of a more general discussion about this, but epistemic violence and bias do exist. And if for a definition of this, I'm gonna use um, uh, Galvin Alvarez's work, um, and, and that quote would be, epistemic violence, that is violence exerted against or through knowledge, is probably one of the key elements in any process of domination. It is not only through the construction of exploitative economic links or the control of a politico-military apparatus that domination is accomplished, but also, I would argue, most importantly through the construction of epistemic frameworks that legitimize and enshrine those practices of domination. So if we have the question as to why Assyrians tend to be in the situation that they're in, and that was the question of my thesis back when I started writing it in 2002, why, is this, why, is, why are the Assyrians not mentioned in academic work very much? Um, well, part of that is based on this issue, right? That, that domination is accomplished not simply through economic means or military means, but also in the way in which knowledge is created, framed, and then utilized. Now, most folks are, are probably very familiar with um, the work of Edward Said. Um, and this sort of general discussion, I think, is very important. The, the issue of uh, this ontological understanding, um, but also more so the construction of denial of legitimacy, problematizing textual accounts and nomenclature. So what is this all about? Well, folks that understand or have had some sort of background in this, uh, and, and of course, epistemic violence is not new, right? This is not something new. Um, it exists and has existed for a millennia. Assyrians, uh, Yazidis, uh, Palestinians see it today. Um, it's not a new thing, but perhaps it's in its codification um, and in the way it's, which it's practiced, it has been slightly shifted. So, um, meaning that it reflects, it, the, the sort of the issue itself reflects a sort of decolonizing process that only recently, and not without contention, has gained traction in modern, modern Middle East studies. Meaning that there is an attempt to sort of decolonize the way in which these words are used, the ways in which people are defined, the ways in which communities are, are, are expressed and explained by, by especially by non-heritage um, scholars. Um, and, and that came up very early with Edward Said and his work on Orientalism. Um, you know, since scholars of Middle East studies employ Said, I thought to employ Said as well and, and remind scholars that, and, and folks that um, within Orientalism, Orientalism itself, sort of otherizing people, right, otherizing the East from a Western perspective, is supported by institutions, vocabulary, scholarship, imagery, doctrines, and even colonial bureaucracies and colonial styles. But I, I really want folks to pay attention to institutions, vocabulary, scholarship, imagery, and doctrines, because that's really what the discussion is uh, for this talk. So what is that and, and how does that work? Well, epistemic violence occurs and manifests in a variety of ways, in a variety of forms, both oral and written. Um, and it's interesting because from it, within this oral and written world, from both accepted nomenclature to canonizing of definitions to something as simple as the usage of textual symbols, so as symbols or imagery are important here, I'll give you this example. Has anyone ever heard of air quotes when people use this, this uh, sort of the air quotes? Um, these are also referred to as, in, in the scholarly parlance of today, uh, scare quotes. 
Now, this is the, in, in Greek, this is the anti-lambda, but we, of course the, the quotes that are used today in English are slightly different, but not distinguishable from, let's say, French or Spanish usage. Um, this idea, especially in French, the, this idea of the, the, the anti-lambda is used frequently, and it was used in the ancient Greek world. Now, what did it mean? Well, it goes back to ancient Greece and was used to denote something dubious, right? Something that was questionable. It questions validity, relevance, significance, and meaning. And they are known, you know, as I said, as scare quotes today, and they connote something with little or no validity. Now, the usage of scare quotes combined with particular nomenclature and standard definitions serve to denigrate or negate the existence of those people or those communities being written about. Examples of their usage in scholarly works on Assyrians abound. It's everywhere on scholarly works. I'm going to give you some examples of those today. Uh, genocide scholar Mark Levine. First, however, a few more words about the people themselves, including an apology. And think about the word apology. Given that the term Assyrian is just plain wrong. Now, see the Assyrian in the quotes. This is the scare quotes. Meaning that he himself, the scholar Mark Levine, does not agree with the term Assyrian and sees it as dubious. Owing everything to a 19th century Western Orientalism and nothing to the community it purports to describe. The correct appellation, at least the one used by the in question, the people in question themselves traditionally used is Suraya, i.e. Syrians. So of course it's funny, he takes the term Suraya in the Assyrian language and decides to himself translate it as Syrian. But notice the usage of the anti-lambda, right, the Assyrians. Um, scholar of New Aramaic, and actually predominantly Arabic, Wolfgang Heinrich did something very similar. Um, uh, a quote from one of his works from 1993, Obviously, in saying this, uh, this, the presumption is that we are indeed dealing with a revivification rather than a continuous tradition of the name, meaning the name Assyrian. The latter is what many modern Assyrians would prefer to believe. However, there's no evidence that their forebearers in pre-modern times called themselves, again, quotation marks, Assyrian, in the sense of claiming descent from an ancient people of that name. And it's a priori unlikely that they would see that, um, seeing that the ancient Assyrians do not have good press in the Bible. We'll get back to the Bible comment in a second, but another example of that. Uh, J.F. Coakley in the Church of the East and the Church of England. Here I refer to the link created between modern, quote, Assyrians and the ancient Assyrians. So again, it's the modern Assyrians that are being looked at as dubious. Um, the Assyrians of Nineveh, known to readers of the Old Testament. Again, hearken to the Old Testament. In modern times, Syrian children have been named Sergon, my namesake, Nebuchadnezzar, etc. The winged lions of Nineveh have appeared as national symbols, and in short, the name is now inseparable from a whole bogus ethnology. Now, note the term bogus here. That's a very heavy term. Um, again, another quote from uh, Coakley, the first currency of, quote, Assyrian may be traced to the years before world, the First World War, when a name was sought by secularly minded Syrians to denote their nation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. He then goes on to say, and so the semantic state of affairs is essentially unfortunate. You can see down here that Assyrian is in scare quotes again, and the terms semantic state of affairs and unfortunate. Again, the nomenclature that's being used. Um, occasionally, again, Assyrian is used in an extended sense, and it's been coined by, right here, nationalists, right? So this usage is very typical. Um, from scholar Adam Becker, I, I want to bring this one up, um, who works mostly on, on early church history and Jewish-Christian um, connections, um, wrote this piece uh, and has written some more stuff recently on, um, <clears throat> on Assyrians, uh, and especially with issues of uh, connections to the modern world and missionary enterprise, and again sort of has something very similar. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but um, suffice to say that this actual quote, so that you know, uh, that in 2005 he had a, pers a persistent disagreement, uh, a friendly but persistent disagreement with somebody in Southeast Turkey at Deir Zafaran Monastery. That was me. Um, I was the one who had that disagreement with Adam. And for several, day several days we had had this conversation. Um, as, as he states here, my interlocutor, this is from act an actual text that he published later on the Asturians and the early discussion of identity. Um, uh, he, he says, you know, that uses the term uh, Syriac Christians and that he was sort of looking at this very dubiously. Now, of course, from the same discussion, he says, my immediate response to these claims of continuity from the ancient world is hogwash. 
Others have pointed out it's the Western missionaries that come in the 19th century and give these people this identity. So again, hearkening back constantly to the fact that it's the West that gives the Assyrians this identity, this idea of who and what they are, right? So it's a very typical colonialist, orientalist way of looking at it. But notice the term again, hogwash, right? So it's either scare quotes or terminologies like hogwash or bogus ethnology. Um, now, now, this is something that sort of continued, right? Um, such stat strategies of epistemic violence exist, and they've been adopted and reiterated in academia and its continued propagation across generations of scholars and have become epistemological and ontological methods for studying the Assyrians and their respective communities. So when one scholar starts doing it, the others sort of pick up on that scholar and continue to repeat the same story, right? The same tale is told using the same terminologies, the same imagery, the same wording in many cases. Um, they also reflect a deep-seated and racialized power hierarchy and shift the sense of identity and belonging from that of members of the community, after all, what, do, what does the Assyrian community know about itself, to a very Eurocentric view held by predominantly white scholars on telling the community who they are not. That is a very important piece. Rather than listening to the community and what they've been saying for generations, they're rather, it seems to be an, a desire to talk about the community and what they are not. Um, I wanted to add, <coughs> excuse me, add a piece here um, so that, oh, we'll go back for a second, excuse me. Um, so this is, is something that is, is very typical and it's, it's been done and published in scholarly works um, through the modern day. Now, um, I'm going to use an, an Iraqi scholar, a scholar of, of Iraq, uh, or I don't even, I, tend, I hesitate to use the term scholar, but writer um, of two articles on Assyrians, in particular the Assyrian Affair of 1933, um, and uh, volumes, or I should say issue one and two, both published in the International Journal of Middle East Studies. Now, this is the the organ, this is the journal of the of MESA, the Middle East Studies Association, one of the largest Middle East Studies associations in, in the world, scholarly associations. Um, Khaldun Husri was a, um, a writer, uh, born and raised in Iraq, um, and in these two articles, you know, again, published in the largest, most, uh, probably the most prestigious uh, journal of the of Middle East in 1974, when writing about the Samael Massacre of 1933, right? Now, again, keep in mind, this is the Samael Massacre that was utilized by a young Raphael Lemkin two months later in 1933 to argue um, in Madrid that there were crimes being committed currently against human beings that he called crimes of barbarism and crimes of vandalism. And he went immediately following Samael, and in his notes, Samael is mentioned as a genocidal act. Now, of course, Raphael Lemkin was, became well known in 1948 for creating the Genocide Convention and the wording um, uh, of, of the Genocide Convention. Now, in 1933, though, when he went to Madrid to argue for the crimes of barbarism and vandalism, his work met with pretty much deaf ears. But he was referring to this, uh, this issue of 1933 and to the Assyrian Genocide in his work. Now, when Husri writes about the Assyrian um, uh, the Samael Massacre of 1933, notice the terminology, the Assyrian affair. Affair, not genocide, not destruction, not battle, not any affair. It's, it's very sort of, um, uh, it's dismissive in a sense, right? It's something sort of casual. And this is the quote from the beginning of that text. History, Ernst Toller once observed, is the propaganda of the victors. And it may, it may often be so, but in the case of the Assyrian affair of 1933, history decidedly is the propaganda of the victims. So in 1933, so in writing this article about 1933 and the Samael massacre, calling it the, the Assyrian affair, and decidedly uh, making this comment, this academic comment, right, with a very heavy bias, obviously, saying that, the, that propaganda typically goes to the victors, but in this case, it's the Assyrians who created the propaganda around Samael. Now, what's interesting about that, of course, is that in that same discussion, Husri continues the same misnomer that's typically granted, given to the Assyrians, that Assyrians are external to these regions, that they're alien, 
that the Assyrians in Iraq, in this case, came from Haikari, which is in modern-day Turkey. Um, they were Nestorian Christians, former subjects of the Ottomans, and brought in by the British, right? This is a very typical way of looking at the Assyrians. Now, what's interesting is that in that same article, he also states that he himself, on August 26, practically the entire city of Baghdad turned out to welcome the army units returning from the completion of their operations against the Assyrians, which saw anywhere from three to 6,000 people killed and over 100 villages razed and destroyed and looted. Thousands upon thousands of men, women, and children filled the streets and the squares and the rooftops of the city, again, bringing uh, sort of a celebratory um, act uh, for the, the returning victorious Iraqi army that just massacred these Assyrians. Um, there were children filled the streets, the squares, and the rooftops, and traffic was brought to a standstill. The immersed crowds cheered, cheered deliriously in the capital. Men, women, and children showered flowers and rose water on the troops from above. The writer, meaning Husri himself, the writer well remembers that day he and his sister were allowed to pick all the roses and flowers in their garden, filling every available basket and container at home, and then scattering them, the contents on the heads of the marching troops from the balcony of a doctor's clinic overlooking Rashid Street. Planes from the Iraqi army flew over in the city, raining clouded leaflets that carried the following words written in a welcoming, by the welcoming committee. Welcome, protectors of the fatherland. Stand up to your enemies, the tools of, and creatures of imperialism. Again, referring to the Assyrians as British uh, imperialists or imperial subjects. The army and Crown Prince Ghazi, who, uh, who openly displayed approval of the campaign against the Assyrians, had made him the darling of the masses at that point, and he was cheered to the heavens. That was a quote directly from um, Husri. Now, of course, what's interesting about Husri is that's, of course, a very nationalistic take. Husri was talking about being very happy and enjoying the celebrations. Now, this celebration also took place um, showing uh, spikes with watermelons, representing the heads of Assyrians with daggers thrust in them. So this is very interesting. Now, he's referring to this in his tale, and he writes this article, and not only was it published once, it was published twice in the Journal of Middle East Studies. Now, who was Husri, and why does this even matter? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, Khaldun Husri was the son of Sati al-Husri. And Sati al-Husri, um, this is just a, a quote from Sati al-Husri, but Sati al-Husri um, was a uh, interesting person. Uh, in that Sati al-Husri was the, the, the elder here, um, was born in Yemen to a prominent and wealthy family originally from Aleppo, and went on to become the director of general education of Iraq from 1922 to 1927. He was the architect of the newly established educational system. And in fact, this is a quote from him, from Husri himself, from the elder Husri, only by removing the child from the family and the village and subjugating him to a nationalist education and military training, could his loyalty be oriented towards the nation, end quote. Now, it's interesting that such, oriental, uh, so, such orientations not only reflected the institutionalization of Arab and Iraqi nationalism in the state, but also the ideological manifestations of what and who the people of Iraq were, and also who they were not, meaning the Assyrians were sort of left out. And also the fact that this became the sort of the rallying cry or call for who the Iraqis were seen to be from the perspective of modern academics. And if anyone wants to read this quote, it's a longer quote from um, translated, uh, taken from uh, Adid, uh, Adid Dawish's Arab nationalism in the 20th century. Um, the Arabic speaking people, this is the quote from Husri, every Arab speaking people is an Arab people. Every individual belonging to these Arabic speaking peoples, peoples is an Arab. And if he does not recognize this, and if he's not proud of it, then we must look for reasons that have made this. So this whole discussion of Arab nationalism, and in fact creating a national enterprise, um, and he is celebrated today, and, and just as an understand, so that folks have sort of an understanding about how this also connects to not just the expression of how people quote him, or quote Khaldun Husri, who by the way is the number one person that is referenced on the Samail massacre, but also that that this is influencing academia, uh, or has an undue influence on academia, and the ethics of how Assyrians are treated. Um, what's interesting here is that Husri himself 
Khaldun um, Khosri, there's an actual, um, there is a, a, an actual um, a grant that is offered every year under his name um, in, uh, I believe, at the American University of Beirut. That it's in fact called the Khaldun Sati Al Husri Scholarship that was established in February of 2019 by Ali Al Husri. Now, this is interesting, of course, because it shows that the academic world is heavily and unduly influenced by other types of nationalism. Although it's interesting, the Assyrians are typically always uh, being equated as being nationalists. Um, and, and yet, at the same time, here are scholars talking about that and being sort of held up on a particular pedestal. Um, so it's okay to be an Iraqi or an Arab nationalist, but not necessarily an Assyrian one. Uh, and this is an example from a recent work. I'm not going to go heavily into it, but um, this is from a book called uh, Writing the Modern History of Iraq. And it's really interesting. The scholar here, um, Visser, uh, mentions, well, when you're working on Iraq, perhaps at, for, as an example, who is an Assyrian in Iraq? What about Christians who refer to themselves as Chaldeans? And then says, historically, the most ardent, again, scare quotes, Assyrianists among the Iraqi Christians are also the smallest and by far the most recent addition to the Christian community. Again, hearkening back to that discussion that most Assyrians in this particular um, area came from the Haikari Mountains and were settled after the First World War. Again, a complete misnomer, and as I said, um, Mariam Gurgis has done a, an excellent job about discussing this. Now, what does this all mean, and how does this sort of, uh, how is this sort of seen? Well, what is the etic, what is the emic and etic way that this sort of happens? And, and how do we understand it, and why is it important? Well, what do we mean by emic and etic? I'm using these anthropological terms, right? If you want to think about emic as being the internal discourse, the, the, the discussion or the identity that comes from within, and etic being the external discourse of the, the identity or the discussion that comes from with, without. Now, the Assyrians themselves certainly play a role in this and, and have their own emic discussion of who they are. Now, emic and etic are not always completely Un unlinked, of course, uh, they're frequently heavily linked together, um, and frequently an emic understanding needs to be contextualized, right? It needs to be put in its proper time and space. Otherwise, we don't understand why people are speaking the way they are about who and what they are. Uh, this is just an example of the Assyrian, of, excuse me, of the United States Census um, from, I think this is a 1930 census, if I remember correctly, uh, and giving you an example of an Assyrian family from Turkey, uh, from or let's say left the Ottoman Empire uh, at the time, and uh, came to the United States. Now you can see um, the person and the place of birth on, on the right here. Uh, this person was saying that they were born in Assyria, and the father was born in Assyria, and the mother was born in Assyria, and the language spoken at home was Assyrian. Now notice, notice how violence is done here to the Assyrian name and identity. Notice how the A and the S are crossed out in each one of these. Now that was something that was done later. That was not something, uh, as census accounts, as how they worked in the United States. Originally, people would walk around, speak to people at their houses, and they would write things down. So that means, most likely, this was written down originally by the census taker, brought back to the home base, and then taken by the next census account taker, who looked at the term Assyria, said that there is no Assyria, there is no Assyrian language, and crossed it out and simply basically making it Syria and Syrian. Just to show how violence is done, even at a non-academic level, to the identity, to the people, uh, to the Assyrian people. Um, some other emic expressions would be examples like British betrayal of the Assyrians of, of Yusuf Malik. Now, I'm not gonna go into other emic expressions right now, only because that's not the, the focus of my work, um, but suffice to say that it has been done, and it continues to be done by Assyrian scholars, but it's not looked at and almost never quoted. So for instance, Khaldun Husri is quoted, um, I think I found, at a 99% rate over, let's say, Yusuf Malik's The British Betrayal of the Assyrians. And The British Betrayal is looked at, Yusuf Malik is looked at as being a, a nationalist, Assyrian nationalist and as someone who is biased to the particular situation. Whereas Khaldun Husri, who you all just saw, was showering soldiers in Iraq, who had just committed these atrocities against Assyrians in Samail, showering soldiers with flowers, um, and then writes this article in 1974 about Samail, 
is actually not only accepted, but it becomes the article that everyone sort of quotes from then on. Um, so, uh, what are some other edict frustrations? I'm not going to go into this too much, but I want to just to show you um, that this also comes up in, in Husri, uh, that this is what Husri states, that when the writer met uh, Bakr Sidqi, who was the, the uh, major military um, general involved in the Samail massacre, now he's responding, talking about himself meeting Sidqi for the first time a few days after his return from Mosul. He patted me on the shoulder and asked me what I wanted to be when I finished school, and I said an army officer. This is all being said by Husri in that article, by the way. Husri was an eyewitness to the celebrations for the returning Iraqi troops and remembers his feelings very well. Yet there remains the paradox of the Assyrian perspective as nothing beyond a tired account of an oppressed minority. Now this is a typical term that's used to sort of bypass anything that the Assyrians wish to say is, well, this is a typical response of victimhood. It's a tired account. Now, it's not the only time you see this. Um, I'll give an example in Syriac studies. Uh, Sebastian Brock's work with the Hidden Pearl. Sebastian Brock, um, David Taylor, and Witold Witkowski's 2001, the, the, the very you know, problematic uh, The Hidden Pearl, uh, published on the Syrian Orthodox Church. Under a particular subheading in, in, in one of the, novel, in one of the uh, volumes, there was a subheading entitled A Tiresome Issue. A Tiresome Issue which all deals with the discussion of being Assyrian. In passing, it should be mentioned that some have regrettably preferred to take on the, regrettably, think about the terminology again, regrettable to who or whom? Regrettable also to scholarship, right? Of course, to the scholars. Regrettably preferred to take on the name, and then again in scare quotes, quote, Assyrian, which over the course of the past 200 years or so has become widely adopted by the Church of the East, uh, so on and so forth. Whereas early Syriac writers used the term rather than Suroi or Suraya, the term uh, Athuraya or Othuroyo, um, uh, they that that should have been the term that was used is what they mean here for the for the for the real word Assyrian. But even when they used that, they were typically denoting that the writer or the person or the region, the geographical region of Mosul or Athur. Now. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but some of you know Salihi Sonyel's work on the Assyrians of Turkey, victims of major power policy, uh, Turkish scholar uh, writing for um, uh, the, the Turk Tarihi uh, um, Cultural Center. Uh, typically, this is sort of like the anti-Assyrian movements in Turkey. Now, what's really interesting, of course, this is considered a scholarly text, and this is the beginning of it. The beginning, this is the quote. A number of Assyrians, particularly a few extremists who have immigrated to West Europe and North America from Turkey mainly for economic reasons, have indulged in propaganda, spreading rumors intermittently that were compelled, they were compelled to leave their homeland because they were oppressed. Now, I'm again not going to go into that, but think of the terminologies that are used, the violence that's done against Assyrians. If you call an Assyrian extremist or them engaging in propaganda, again, think back to uh, Husri then typically the Assyrian usage and the Assyrians themselves are sort of dismissed. Now, of course, then you have to ask the question, is, is history important? Because this is the history that's being given about the Assyrians. This is the historiography that actually exists. Now, is it important? Um, and I, I'm going to use Linda uh, Tuhewe Smith's work on decolonizing methodologies. And this is the quote from, uh, from Linda's work. It is because of these issues that I ask this question, is history in its modernist construction important or not important for indigenous peoples. Now you could you could substitute Assyrian peoples here if you'd like, but I'm also thinking Assyrians as an indigenous group, as a native people. And she then answers herself with a resounding no. History is not about right, but about power. History is not about right, but about power. Now of course then we have to ask what can be done. And, and uh, in her text, she does ask herself that same question and she says, I myself thought that once I told the truth, I wrote a book, I wrote the, the truth about what had happened, that people would finally understand it. Um, now, uh, I'm just going to read this quick piece. Um, when, when the book that I wrote, my monograph came out in 2015, um, and when my monograph came out in 2015, Reforging a Forgotten History, uh, the Assyrians in Iraq in the 20th Century, 
One of the interesting things was that it was reviewed uh, in 2016 in the American Historical Review, so probably one of the largest um, uh, journals uh, of history, if not the largest journal of history in the world. Uh, and this was the quote from, from the review. The, the reviewer noted that the account, now this is a direct quote, quote, the account of Assyrian identity politics in the Donabed text is am ambitious and intriguing, yet it at times is patchy and unclear. Part of this is the result of a somewhat ambiguous, politically contentious meaning attached to the term, and she's, the, the scholar says, Assyrian, again in scare quotes, which the author does not qualify. The term has been used to indicate the followers of the Nestorian church, again, using the, the same terminology that is used by missionaries, that's used by early scholars. Um, one of Christian denominations represented, as well as more generally Eastern Christians and members of an ethnic group united by an ancient liturgical language. As a racial marker, the, the term, uh, uh, quote, Assyrian is used again and is central to the semantic toolkit. So this is a very typical usage that's, that, that is done um, and the sort of violence that is continued uh, through both the written word but also orally, this sort of passed down through academia. So let me just conclude with uh, one piece here. Um, uh, so I'll move through this fairly <laughs> quickly. Um, so what then becomes this, uh, the approach? Should it be a new approach? Uh, an old approach, a new approach, or something just entirely different. Part of the problem of, an, of, of the old approaches is, is that these fields, again, Assyriology, Syriac studies, Neo-Aramaic studies, even modern Middle East, that has space for Assyrians at times, uh, they were created by non-Assyrians. And it, if that has been the case, and if the case has been that it has been the identity of Assyrians and the non nomenclature that's used and the symbols that are used, follow the same discussion point over and over again, and it's regurgitated and re-cemented over and over again, like all those scholars have done, as you've seen in, these t in, the, um, in the work in front of you in the PowerPoint, then the old work simply would not work. Then could you create a new one? Well, part of the problem with the new approach is that um, it's not always simple, because in the academic world, it does use a particular vocabulary. Um, Franz Fanon po posited that to speak a language is to take on a world, a culture. Now, how does this, how does one then prove oneself to be accepted within the hallowed halls of the academy? Well, modeling, of course, right? Scholars then model what scholars did before them. So if scholars before them are negative towards Assyrians, then scholars, then the new scholars, even Assyrians themselves, trying to fit into the academic discourse, start to model certain things, you know? First, there's an accept, acceptance of these etic narratives of identity offered by the majority, the elite, and then comes this more sectarianization of identity. And, and unfortunately, that happens with Assyrians themselves getting into the academic world. Um, finally, let me simply say that um, the ability to argue the neglect of Assyrians in academic space through the language of academia would make sense to a community attempting to assert some semblance of agency. Fanon knew this issue with this line, the issue with this line of thinking, and to use a quote from Audre Lorde, uh, who famously remarked that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, we must rethink this. So utilizing the tools of academia that has, through epistemic violence, made Assyrians negligible and thus not worthy of engagement cannot also make Assyrians and their heritage known by them a legitimate thing. As Linda Smith pondered, it is because of these issues that I ask that question. Can something be done? My, my response to that is simply that the monolithic rubrics must be challenged and deconstructed, and a new ontological pathway, proposed theories, and specific narratives and nomenclature must be used and shifted to create a more illustrative region and its heritage. Um, this last piece is simply to understand this, to say this new ontological and epistemological approach, which could be applied to all similar cases, could be a bridge across the chasm between objectivists and constructivists, and it could balance these postulations. It could balance that human reality is shaped largely by, by socially accepted, quote, knowledge that is assumed to be re reality. Secondly, that there is intent and intent, therefore, is a powerful instrument that is employed both heedfully and unwittingly to either produce 
or extinguish significance. Think about how people use air quotes or scare quotes. Um, and then these two axioms, while constructivist, they fail to incorporate Assyrians. And so there's a final postulation, and that is both relative axiomatic expressions and the second piece, the intent, are beholden to an objective reality that has to be redefined with the Assyrians as part and parcel of it in order to move forward. And that is the only way it will shift in the academic discourse. And that is why Assyrian studies has been created as a totally distinct field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sargon. Well, as you have seen, by the way, Sargon, don't forget to send me the whole text uh, in order to start editing the, this excellent, marvelous conference we have been listening to until now, and yours is among them. Uh, thank you for the not only excellent, but very, very rich and informative uh, conference you have uh, given. Out Rabara, Basima. I am sure that uh, there might be many questions, but I'm sorry I have to be disciplined, because otherwise we are going to, uh, you know, we, this, the Semitic environment is, has a general concept of the time. And we have learned to be a bit much more uh, disciplined in this sense. Just we are allowed to have two questions. Uh, one is uh, Julie's one and the other one. If not, it's better. <laughs> no, because of the time, otherwise I know. Uh, we will have the chance also to share with our scholars. Uh, as you have seen, the new Assyrian generation is pushing in an excellent way. They are highly well prepared. They are highly uh, professionals. And this is what we need. We have to work together, we have to share, in order to avoid that the others tell us who we are, in order to avoid that the others tell us who we are not, or we aren't. And now time has come that we say who we are, and how we understand <coughs> us as a people, a nation, and as a heritage which is different from the others. This is uh, the work, Sargon, you have been working on. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, can I just, uh, I just wanted to say that I promise I actually didn't go over time. We started about nine or 10 minutes later for me. So I promise I was being disciplined. But also, I will just say, as you said, um, one piece to think about here is that um, the, and, and I'll just leave this, and I know there, the, I, I want to talk about the questions, but I'm happy to talk more about this in the future. There are many, many examples of this and, and how it's started and continued and how it continues today. And let me just offer this one thing. For me, this is not a discussion. This, 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 this issue is not a discussion. There is very, a very real ontological worldview that had been created about who the Assyrians are, and then the epistemological discussions simply follow that. Um, th there is no longer a discussion about having to listen to people about the sort of uh, let's rethink who the Assyrians are. Not interested in that. Um, th this is sort of let's move forward at this point. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to go into the various ways in which, and, and actually something came out in 2022, which I can tell you guys about later, but go ahead, I'll, I'll leave it open. Now the first question is, uh, Julie is going to put the first question and I will do the second. So, uh, thank you, Sargon, for your discourse or conference. Um, so, only to take a summative uh, approach to this, um, your goal is basically to um, uh, deconstruct the mistakes, let's say mistakes, in the denomination of our people. And uh, what I like to ask you is if your um, goal is also to um, offer a contemporary, um, let's say, definition of our people because we have the issue between, you already took reference to them, to the Arameans and Assyrians. So we would have to deconstruct the whole history or 
at least the uh, nomenclature that have been used um, not really, let's say, correctly. So I'd just like to ask you if this is one of your goals, or let, let's say um, last goals in your uh, academic uh, investigation. And also, of course, it's about academic context. But we have to keep in mind that we have a lot of um, young people as well who maybe define themselves as Arameans. So we would need to um, find a channel, let's say, to um, inform our youth and also people, of course, about this, um, let's say, deconstruction. And we, had, we um, would need to actualize um, a whole name, let's say, like that, like it is. So I would like to hear your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know which dialect to use, but some tell me, uh, okay. Uh, which, uh, which, so let, let me say, thank you so much for the, the question, Julie. I, let me say that, um, okay, so first and foremost, I would say that my, I'm not really interested in deconstructing. I'm rather interested in, in uh, you know, one of the responses of indigenous people typically is a response of incivility, right? Sort of challenging, challenging the way things have been done. So more, I see myself as simply challenging. I'm bringing up the issue. I'm sort of uh, highlighting what has been done and showing it to folks to say, this is what has been done to Assyrians from the beginning of the scholarly discourse, right? Um, and, and let me say that the, the issue of this, the, the, to me, there is no naming issue. The naming issue has been first and foremost sort of created by external forces and then internalized by Assyrians, right? This is not a, this is not something that um, has become, you know, the, the question of did they use the term Assyrian to express themselves in the 5th century, in the 10th century, in the 15th century, that's not a question. I mean, it, it's, it's, an, imbus, it's an, an idiotic attempt to assume that a people stand unchanging through centuries and millennia. I mean, why would somebody in the 8th century who's trying to survive living in a particular village in the middle of, you know, Mesopotamia have to wake up and say, I'm a descendant of, you know, Ashurbanipal? They wouldn't. That's not a necessity, right? It's not a necessity to their daily lives. So in order to contextualize why people or were or were not talking about that, that's simply what I want to do is to express that when scholars talk, oh, your community did this, or this community, or the Assyrians said this, or they did that, I'm also challenging the way in which they're looking at it. That they're creating these impossibilities. I'll give you an example. When they say that the term Athur or Athuraya or Othuroyo is the correct term in the classical Syriac or Aramaic or whatever they want to call the language, as the correct term for Assyrian, rather than Suraya or Suroya, which means Syrian. The term Syrian is a Western, no Assyrian woke up one day and said, well, I'm gonna translate in, in English the word Suraya, Ana Khasuraya, you know, Ono Suroyo, I'm gonna say I'm a Syrian in English. They didn't do that. The term Assyrian and Syrian, these are, 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 these are first of all, they're English terms, of course, right? Why would people, why would Assyrians have to do that? They wouldn't. The translations of all of these terms are also under Western discourse and Western understanding. So to me, I, I agree with you that these discussions should be had, not necessarily to, not necessarily to reconstruct an Assyrian identity. I think an Assyrian identity has always existed, it's just been suppressed. It's been constantly suppressed by academic discourse, by media discourse, by political discourse, and then when that happens, Assyrians take that discourse and internalize it, right? In order to become an academic today, if you're outwardly Assyrian and going and looking for a job, good luck. It is not easy to get a job if you're doing that. And I'm, I say that as I'm a full professor, I can get away with saying that. I probably shouldn't have said that when I was not a full professor, but I did anyway because that's also just simply who I am. But I've been challenging this since I started, and it's partly because I saw an ethical dilemma, that this was the situation. And just so you know, this Athuraya thing, I just wanted to show you guys this. It, it's, it's really amusing to me because, um, let me, you know, that this Athuraya idea, can I show this to you guys really quickly? Look at the screen if you can see it. Here's an example. 
of, the, of the, how this is funny. So on the screen here, you see this? Um, I don't know if you can yes. see it in the background. So this is a letter that I found in Scotland. At the, at, nobody goes to the archives in Scotland. Everyone goes to the archives in England. I found this in Scotland. This is a letter from, um, uh, from Ruwil, from the patriarch uh, uh, Ruwil Shimon, Ruwil Shimon um, to the, um, the prelate of the Church of Scotland. And in this context, now we've all seen this term, right? The use of authoria is gentilic. It means somebody from Mosul. The Protestant used it, used it for this reason. Here is the Caesarian in, in the, uh, uh, 1886 saying, sitting up on the mountains in Haikari, saying right here, from our, from our, um, our, you know, Qelayten, from our patriarchal RC, in Puchanas, this is Puchanas right here, right, you can go back to it, you can see it better, um, Puchanas, uh, author. So even when, as, now think about that. He's talking about Bochanas. Bochanas is not five miles from Mosul. Bochanas is, is very far away from Mosul. This is not, this is not Kirkuk, it's not Erbil, it's not Mosul. This is distinct, right? And he's calling it the mountains of Assyria. Awful. These are the problems whenever Assyrians do assert their identity, they're challenged. Now, I use this as an example only because I, I found it years ago and I still haven't had a chance to publish all of this, which I'm hoping to do now. But this is a perfect example. Assyrians use various terms and they used it in the way that they understood it. But it's only Western scholars that sort of pick and choose different ideas that fit their narrative. And that's been the problem is that they've created a narrative and they only utilize terms and expressions that fit that narrative to say Assyrians are not really Assyrian, they're Nestorians, et cetera, et cetera. That's my, that has been my biggest concern, is to sort of bring that back to the forefront to say, these are issues, we need to look at them. Um, but, but you're right about the discourse about, about young, young people. Um, I mean, I think the only way to do that is to have smaller discussions, right? Have, get people together and have smaller discussions with um, young folks who are in high school and, and middle school. Um, but the only problem with all of this, honestly, Julie, is the fact that the formative years of your identity come from your parents. So between, you know, the ages of four and eight, a lot of this stuff is already cemented in your head. It takes a lot to sort of shift that. Thank you very much. As you have underlined, uh, you started giving the fields that were, uh, that were, uh, announced as uh, scientific fields. It started with Assyriology, you ended up with Neo-Aramaic uh, studies. And now the next step, and that must be done by the Assyrians, is the modern Assyrian studies. Whether we want or not, we have to focus on them in order to clarify all these questions. The new generation needs absolutely answers given by their own people, that they understand themselves as Assyrians, that they feel as Assyrians, they speak Assyrian, and they will focus and also somehow will get all the branches together in an intelligent way. If we work in this sense together with the modern Assyrian studies, and Assyrians, you are all invited to participate in the ways you are able to. You have big experts. This is a clear message. Just use them, invest in them. This is the way in order to clarify what it means being Aramean. No, it's not Aramean. The language is one thing, and the identity is another issue. The cultural issues are one, and what have been given from the others is another issue. We have been baptized several times by different names, by different definitions, by the others. And we were baptized for once, forever. But we shifted somehow due to the ignorance we have upon our own history, language, and so on. And I'm the first one. I'm not uh, saying that every assembly is ignorant, but we generally are ignorant in our own history. This is why there are so many <coughs> divisions. We are split into I don't know how many uh, branches tomorrow, if another 
name comes out, a group will go with his uh, leader, especially a spiritual leader, and thus must be avoided. And how can we avoid it? Creating specific study fields. Modern Assyrian studies is an imperative. Or we do it, or we will fail again and again. But I'm sure that we will, we will succeed with our goals to tell to the people who we are in an intelligent way, in a well-trained way. We will tell to the people what our language is, is Sur Surait, and not I don't know what. And we will have the chance to come together. If we do it with respect, love, and unity, I'm sure we'll, we will achieve our goal. This is uh, the last, these are the last words. I'm thankful to you again for your excellent presentation. And next time is in, imperative to have you here. Uh, I hopefully with coronavirus, we will be then over the, the whole problems and then we will enjoy your presence uh, in person among us. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone for being here. I just wanted to ask, are we doing the next, the panel discussion? It or would be that... good if you can, if you can uh, yes. rest connect. We are going to have now 30, 20 minutes, I think, and then we will come back to the round table. It will be nice to have you here. Yeah. Excellent, yes. Okay, yes, thank I'm, you. I'm... Thank okay. you. Thank you all very much. Okay, guys, now is coffee time. No, no, no.